I'm thankful to be joined today by Dr. James Dolezal, who serves at the Radius Theological Institute, uh, where he directs that effort and teaches theology, and also continues to teach uh, at Cairn University in Pennsylvania. And uh, he is joining us from Bakersfield, California. So welcome, Dr. Dolezal. Chris, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. And uh, instead of Scotland, uh, where we're usually chatting, uh, we have Dr. Ferguson joining us here on the Ligonier campus. Uh, so just across the way from my office, uh, we have Dr. Ferguson, thankfully in town, to record uh, some new material for the ministry. And uh, Dr. Ferguson, I'm glad that uh, you were able to make this trek across the pond and for us to have this conversation today. Thank you, Chris. Always a pleasure to be near you and always a pleasure to be technologically near James. Well, Dr. Ferguson, we know that you uh, are still teaching uh, in seminary uh, level and certainly staying busy uh, in writing and speaking in various places, but uh, some of our viewers may be uh, interested to hear of a new post that you've recently taken up uh, there in Aberdeen. Could you tell us just a little bit about that? Well, yes, uh, a younger friend um, and minister approached me before COVID set in to ask if I might be able to come and help him in Trinity Church in Aberdeen. Um, and after COVID and all the logistics uh, just a couple of months ago, um, I started uh, doing some preaching um, I'm, I think I'm called the Honorary Associate Preacher, um, which in Anglican terms probably means the fourth curate. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted to have the privilege of sharing in his ministry. David Gibson is the minister. He's an extremely able minister. He doesn't need my help, but I think I may be the oldest Presbyterian he actually knows. And so I think he's, I think he's just glad to have my friendship as much as anything else, Chris. But it's a, it's a delight to be with him. Well, that's wonderful to hear. We're all thankful for your friendship. And we're thankful for your help today uh, and yours, Dr. Dolezal, as we turn to the subject of the classical doctrine of God. Now, of course, at Ligonier, we speak of theology often. So what would you say to a Christian to help him to understand why we talk about theology and how it relates to even areas such as worship? Well, Chris, theology is really just speech about God. You know, that's the basic meaning of the idea. Um, and many verses of Scripture come to mind when we think about the importance of that for all of us as Christians. Um, think, for example, of the, the famous words in Jeremiah 9, that the wise man shouldn't boast in his wisdom, or the rich man in his riches, or the strong man in his strength. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he knows me, that I am the Lord. And those are words that the Apostle Paul picks up uh, in his letters and says, this really belongs to the epicenter of the Christian life. And there, Paul is simply echoing the Lord Jesus, um, in his prayer in John 17, this is eternal life, to know you, the, the true God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So right at the center of the gospel and Jesus' understanding of what the gospel effects, what he came to die and to rise again for, what he intercedes for at the right hand of God, is that his people, through him, by the Spirit, will come to know his Father, and therefore to come to know God, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to be able to enjoy communion with him, which is, at the end of the day, what we were originally created for uh, at the beginning. So theology is, in a sense, simply a description of all that we think of from Scripture what we learn from the grace of God in each other's lives about who God is and how our lives relate to him, how we are reconciled to him and how we live for him. And again, that brings us back to the first question and answer in the Shorter Catechism. What is our chief end? Our chief end is to glorify God. And if we're going to glorify him, we must know him. And it's as we come to know him that we come to enjoy him forever. I would want to echo that and just say that it's it's only in so much as God is known 
that we can give him worship that is proper and due to him. If we are mistaken uh, or in error about who he is, uh, then almost invariably the sacrifice of praise that we bring uh, will be confused or misdirected. I, I, I've often thought that one of the reasons for getting God right, so to speak, for working hard to grow in the knowledge of God and engaging with theology is, in one respect, among others, as, as an antidote to idolatry, to guard our hearts and be sure that when we do come to him in prayer and supplication and when we offer him praise and thanksgiving and we name him as our God, uh, that it is in fact God that we are naming uh, as God and, and not a creature that we've mistaken for him. Uh, and theology should have that effect, not just to inform us, but to clarify and direct our hearts uh, in worship to the one proper object of our worship. Dr. Dolezal, I remember an evening with you like it was yesterday, and I think you know what I'm getting ready to uh, bring up is that moment uh, that was so special. It was just not two months before Dr. R.C. Sproul went to be with the Lord, and we, of course, had no idea at that time. Uh, that fall of 2017, uh, you were here with us, and we were able to go out to dinner with Dr. Sproul and Mrs. Sproul, and uh, that experience was really one of the highlights of my life, but I felt in that moment that I was immediately ushered into a conversation that I barely had the theological tools to grasp as you and R.C., for about three hours, just went back and forth talking about the classical doctrine of God. He had read and reread your book, All That Is In God, and it may have been one of the last theological books that he read before he went to be with the Lord. And I remember him talking about your book uh, in many different settings around the campus um, in the months leading up to that dinner with you, and he was just so enthused by it. And then watching the two of you for, like I said, I think it was about three hours, do these theological high fives to one another. It was a real treat. And Mrs. Sproul and I just marveled at the two of you uh, almost completing each other's sentences. And I even remember at one point as you were discussing the doctrine of God, R.C. said, it feels like I've got the hair standing up on my arm. It, it was a subject that gripped him, and he cared about deeply. And I know he was so appreciative of that work that you had poured in and have continued uh, to develop. So for our viewers and those joining us to watch uh, this discussion, uh, help us to just orient to this subject of what do we mean by talking about the classical doctrine of God, and why should Christians care about this doctrine? Well, of course, that was a, a hallmark theme throughout Dr. Sproul's career, uh, and the uh, the meeting, the dinner that you mentioned, of course, was a, a highlight for me as well. Uh, really, a special time to sit down with uh, with a one more mature and long in the faith, and to realize that what I'm working on, what he had been working on for decades, is is actually not novel or new to either one of us. Uh, but it is, in fact, something that has been uh, a piece of the Christian tradition. Uh, from its very earliest days, e even long predating the Reformation, what we sometimes call classical theism is really just a, a nickname, uh, if you will, uh, for a set of doctrines that you find sort of universally held uh, down the centuries by Christian theologians from North Africa to Asia Minor to Southern Europe and to the ends of the earth, really, uh, eventually, uh, even up to Scotland, uh, you know, and, and the United States, uh, these doctrines have 
have been held and taught and cherished. And in particular, when we talk about the classical doctrine of God, we mean a particular view of God's attributes that that locate him, so to speak, in that realm of transcendence that is his alone uh, and that he doesn't share with any creature. Those attributes that set him apart, not relatively, but absolutely uh, in being and in glory uh, from all of his creatures. And these attrib- some of these attributes that we discussed even there at that uh, wonderful meal were attributes like divine aseity, that God is, God is utterly and perfectly self-sufficient, that God does not receive his being or receive anything from another, but that he's the, the universal giver of all, but not in any way is he the, the needy beneficiary who depends upon his creation. For the, for the believer especially, that's a precious doctrine, realizing that that accentuates that from him and through him and to him are all things, that we receive from him life, breath, and all things, and in him live, move, and have our being. That is an that f- aspect of the divine being that, that really grounds and roots our utter dependency upon him that I, I depend upon him for the next breath I draw, for the life that I live, uh, for the very existence that I possess. And classical theism really emphasizes attributes of God that accentuate his perfect self-sufficiency as the one who is adequate for his own being, but also adequate for the being of all things that depend upon him. So doctrines like divine aseity, divine simplicity is a kind of negative corollary uh, of that doctrine. Um, Impassibility sometimes is is mentioned in that list, divine immutability, and also God's timeless eternity. That God is not among the beings who are currently in process uh, toward a future state of being, but rather he's the one that transcends the entire mutable temporal state of affairs, the one who is wisely ordering all things to their appointed end, but himself is not in process toward some end. Those, those doctrines and the doctrines that amplify that um, are certainly ones that, that animated us. And I think they animated our discussion in part because in the modern era, in the last couple of hundred years, there has been um, quite an onslaught of opposition um, or at least a, a reconfiguration of those doctrines to dial down their intensity. And at least with regard to the intensity of those doctrines, that's something that Dr. Sproul and I uh, shared as a common conviction. Dr. Ferguson, help us to understand uh, even more uh, why Christians should care about uh, a recovery of a classical doctrine of God. And uh, Dr. Dolezal gave us a lot of terms there that hopefully we'll uh, be able to dive into here in the next few minutes. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm James's uh, honorary associate curate here. He has he's become a very great expert on this subject, but I totally agree with him about its importance um, because at the end of the day, I think what is at issue is God's godness. And related to that is that I think most, if not all, of the negative reactions to the classical doctrine of God that he's just been outlining for us are really trying to make God more manlike. And uh, I remember one of the things that Luther said in his controversy with Erasmus was, Erasmus, your, your God is too manlike. And the net effect goes back to something that James also said earlier on, and that is the more manlike we think of God, the less likely we are to worship him. So that rather than being a negative concept, the classical orthodox view of God has been all through the church's life at the epicenter of the church's worship, um, knowing God, trusting God, having a real heart adoration of God. The greater he is, the more we realize that though he has made us as his image, that's in a very miniature sense. He is unlike us. He is, I think here of the revelation given to Moses at the burning bush, he is the I am. Um, I, um, I am the once I was not. I am one who is in becoming. I am one who someday 
his heart will stop working and his brain will cease to function and people will speak about me in the past tense. But he is, I am. And when I try to master that, I simply get a headache. If I think that my capability as a human being can fully comprehend the God who created the universe, then partly I'm going to get a headache, or if I don't get a headache, I'm going to turn out to be profoundly arrogant. And in either case, I will not be a humble worshiper. And I think the reason why um, in our own time there has been so much animus against the classical doctrine of God, the aseity of God, the transcendence of God, has been because of the tremendous turn towards the self and the subjective and the erroneous notion that often is spoken about in the literature that unless God is like me, for example, unless God uh, can suffer the way I suffer, he cannot really be a, a compassionate God to me. Um, and, you know, I think just at a very basic level, my own response to that has been to think of, like, two of my children are physicians. One's a surgeon, the other's a psychiatrist. Um, I, if I thought ch parents were going to my son and saying, unless you've experienced what my son has experienced, I don't want you to, to help him. You know, that would be lunacy. Or if somebody came to my daughter and said, uh, we don't want you as our psychiatrist unless you've experienced what this person has experienced. Um, we realize the fallacy of that kind of reasoning that has driven an antagonism to the classical doctrine of God. We see the, the, the illogic of it in other areas, um, but we don't apply it to the greatest of all areas. Um, and I think that very much needs to be arrested. And that is one area in which I think uh, James's books have contributed a great deal in the present time. Can I add a footnote on that? I, I really, uh, I think you've hit on something. It's the, sen it's the modern sense that the, that the God of classical Christian theology is somehow aloof and distant, and we've got to reimagine him to sort of get him near and get him involved, and particularly this matter of empathy, that empathy is uniquely able to bring someone into concern and to care about my situation, and without that kind of experience, and without experiencing what I've experienced, the way I've experienced it, that you couldn't know or care about me as well as you might otherwise. I think that's a that's an I, I understand why people make that assumption because amongst us uh, as humans that cert there's certainly a great deal of truth even if not uh, perfectly there's something to that that having had a similar experience of like kind we can perhaps know better or appreciate someone's situation but I th I think that it's perhaps a, a a mistaken presumption to assume that all knowledge and all care can only be obtained or meaningful um, if it's possessed in this particular way. Um, I, I want to submit that, in fact, the God of traditional theism, while he doesn't experience passions or time or, or any of these other things, does not, for all that reason, not care about us, uh, but that, in fact, it's a mistake to think that only if he's like me can he care about me, or only if he knows or feels the way that I do in all of my sort of finitude and mutability, only then could he care about me. I think that's an assumption that perhaps we should challenge um, whether that's indeed the case. Chris, I think to go back to the illustration I used earlier on of Moses at the burning bush, um, we've got both a very powerful statement that I think can only be interpreted in terms of the classical doctrine of God, or it gives rise to the classical doctrine of God. But it's precisely in that context that the I am, who has his being in himself, independent of creation, uh, is everlastingly, eternally the same 
is the God who reveals himself to Moses as the one who sees the need of his people, their bondage in Egypt, and has come to redeem them. And this, to me, I think underlines what James has been saying, that the classical doctrine of God has never been expounded in such a way that God is removed, that he is a prisoner of his transcendence or a, a prisoner of his immutability. Um, he, he is the God who, in his transcendence, deals with the imminent, who in his immutability deals with our mutability. And even the, the, the praise of the church, I think, has recognized this as well as the theologians have by the way in which so many of the great hymns of the church, when they are speaking about the needs, the, the distresses, the lamentations of God's people, keep on returning to the principle that he is the same, he doesn't change. And it's there that we find our strength and our succor and our help in God. So that even in our hymnology, I think there is a powerful testimony to what ordinary Christians through the years have discovered, that it's the, the unchanging God who has his being in and of himself in the blessedness of his triune being, who is the anchor of our souls when we are actually in our deepest distress. And I think we need to keep on affirming that. So what is the doctrine of divine simplicity, and how does that relate to uh, the classical doctrine of God that we're discussing? Maybe I'll say first off on that, that uh, the doctrine of divine simplicity is not as easy as it sounds. There's a, you know, people make much of this. Why is the doctrine of divine simplicity so complex? And I, I appreciate uh, the conundrum of that. And yet, on the other hand, the doctrine of simplicity is, in one respect, uh, uh, very, uh, I think, easy to see in terms of its inner motivation. Uh, so when we say God is simple, we obviously don't mean easy to understand or grasp um, in the sense that he's transcendent and beyond us and the, the finite cannot contain the infinite and, and all the different ways in which we articulate God's beyondness. To call him simple does not mean that he's simplistic uh, in our sort of modern way of using that or that he's a simpleton, uh, not lacking in knowledge. Uh, what we really mean by saying he's simple is that he is not a being that is composed of parts. And we, we find that in our own sort of English tradition and various confessions, the 39 Articles and several confessions, the Westminster and the Savoy and Second London have all said in their Doctrine of God uh, section, usually chapter two, that God is without parts. Uh, so when we say God is simple, we mean without parts. You might think, well, why would, why would that be an important thing that we need to say about God that he's without parts? Doesn't it seem like it's the opposite? If God is all-powerful and if he's the creator and the sustainer of all, shouldn't he be the most complex and multi-parted of beings? And so why say that he's without parts? But what we mean when we say that God is without parts is it's, it's really an exposition of what we mean when we say that God is self-sufficient. And at the, very, at the very core of the conviction of divine simplicity is the conviction that God does not depend on what is not God in order to be God. And everything that depends upon parts or everything composed of parts depends upon parts or features of its being that are more basic than the whole. So I'm, I'm a being composed of parts. Uh, in my substance, I'm composed of body and soul. I have an immaterial part and a material part. And then even, even my material and immaterial parts themselves are composed of various faculties or bits. And so there's a very real sense in which the, the complete me, the complete James, this human, depends on so many things that themselves are not a human. A soul without a body is not a natural human condition. A body without a soul is not a human being. Um, even my body parts, which are more basic than the total body composed of them, none of them is a human body in toto. Things composed of parts depend upon their parts in some respect to be as they are. And then they also depend in a second way on whatever unifies the parts, whatever accounts for the togetherness of the parts. Uh, 
Uh, so that anything composed of parts is a, is a doubly dependent being. It depends upon its parts, the way that all wholes do, and then it depends on whatever assembles or composes or puts them together. If we were to say this about God, then we would say that something not identical with God was in fact accounting for and even causing, in some respect, God to be God. And I think that's that's the heart and soul of this, that for the Christian who believes that God does not depend on what is not himself to be himself, which I, at least in my experience, I find that most Christians, if you put the question to them that way, are committed to a God who doesn't depend on what isn't God to be God. If that is, If that's a core Christian conviction, then divine simplicity is really just a way of defending and protecting that core Christian uh, conviction. Even if you've never heard of the doctrine of simplicity, it may very well be that you're already committed to the doctrine in as much as you're committed to the absolute uncaused self-sufficiency of the God who made all things. Dr. Dolezal, uh, you wrote for us in Table Talk magazine, and I, I was encouraged by the way that you summarized this in a, in a way of practical application. You said that because God is not composed of parts, he cannot fall apart on us. And that was tremendously encouraging to read. I think in terms of spirituality, why does it matter that I know that God is not composed of parts as opposed to a, a, a big, complex thing? And I think it does come down to that, which is that when I depend upon God, my faith, my confidence in him does not reach to some depth of being that undergirds him, that doesn't reach to a being that accounts for him, that is somehow outside of him, that when I trust God for all things, life, breath, and all things, for life, movement, for being itself, that I need to depend upon the God who himself does not depend on another. Uh, And I need to also depend upon one who doesn't have the potentiality of, as it were, going to pieces. And and I want to, again, I'll reiterate the quote, um, the reason God won't go to pieces on you is because there are no pieces of God into which he might go. Um, And I I think that's something that should encourage us. That, That really is an anchor for all of our confidence, our confidence in his word, our confidence in his being upon which he stakes his word really is a confidence that God is irreducible in his absoluteness and being. And if he were reducible, like a multi-parted thing would be, then our faith and confidence would have to, in a certain sense, get underneath God or get behind God somehow. And yet the yet our confidence as Christians doesn't look back of God because there's really nothing back of him. Back to the name that Dr. Ferguson mentioned earlier, that he's the I am, not in a derivative sense, but in an absolutely primal and self-sufficient sense. And when we think about God, I think we we are thinking this way, that actually simplicity is what we think of as God's attributes in their densest unity. And I might lose an attribute and still be me, but those attributes are so densely who God is, that God God could not cease to be holy or gracious or loving or any of the things we tend to think of as distinct attributes and still be God, because these are who, who God is. And this, I think, underlines for us that he actually possesses what we call his attributes in a quite different way from the way we possess them. You know, we can be good, we can be loving, we can be holy. Um, That's how we express ourselves, even in our disunity. But this is who God is through and through. Maybe I'll try another illustration. Um, In Scotland, when we were wee boys, went on holiday, our friends expected us to bring back rock, not rocks, but a long tubular candy that would break your teeth. And different seaside towns would sell this candy with the name of the town on the end. Now, you could buy this candy, this rock, this cylinder, in two forms, a cheap form, a less expensive form, let's say, and an expensive form. In the less expensive form, the name of the town was at the end of both ends of the tube, but if you broke it in the middle, 
it disappeared. In the expensive rock, wherever you broke the rock, the name of the seaside town would be at the end of the, the tube because it was through and through was what the rock really was. And, you know, I'm, I'm the less expensive rock. Um, God is through and through all of these attributes simply because that's who he is. They are originated in him. Um, and that's another reason why when we come to the circumference of our understanding of who God is, then we bow down lost in wonder, love and praise. And we don't say, as you know, I've often remembered Nietzsche said, if there is a God, how can I bear not to be that God? We come uh, and recognize his grandeur and glory and sense the privilege that we did not need to be, uh, we might never have been, we did not make ourselves, we do not sustain ourselves, we won't sustain ourselves after we die, but he has done all of those things for us. You know, all praise and glory to his name is how we respond to this classical exposition of who God is. Would we say that God's attributes are identical and yet distinct? I think we should say that. Uh, and yet we also want to, uh, avoiding the law of non-contradiction here, say that they are, they are identical and yet distinct in different senses. Uh, and so even to a, a point that Dr. Ferguson made, that God possesses his attributes in a way f very differently than we do, there's one respect in which the tradition, if, if you want to be very precise, will say that God does not have attributes or properties, but that he is all of his attributes so that I'm a, to the, to the point made earlier, I'm a haver of wisdom as a gift and, uh, you know, ask anyone who knows me and they'll know that sometimes I have it and sometimes I have not that gift. Uh, that I'm, I have uh, my attributes as something distinct from myself, uh, as something that is a part of me uh, that may very well be a losable part of me, but that God is all of his attributes so that in one respect, God doesn't have goodness. He is his own goodness, that he doesn't have wisdom, but that he is his own wisdom. Now, we might say it in human speech that he has wisdom. There, there is wisdom with God, but in a real sense, wisdom is with God as God, not as something distinct from him that he possesses. So even the way of God having attributes, uh, he has them by identity as opposed to just simply holding on to them as distinct from himself, the way that we have the gifts he gives to us. Uh, and in this respect, uh, the question then is, well, what are the attributes in God? Uh, and the answer, there's a uniform answer given to this in the tradition. And when I say uniform, I really mean this has got to be one of the most widespread, universal, small C Catholic, vanilla, bread and butter, pick your, pick your word, doctrines in all of Christian history. And it's that all that is in God is God that there's not something in God, not God, like a God bit or something like that. There are all sorts of things in me that aren't human, all sorts of attributes that aren't identical with me, the human, and I possess them as gifts, and they certainly enhance my humanity, but they're not identical with me as this man. But there's nothing in God that is not God, and so God just is his own wisdom. He is his own justice. He is his own power. He is his own uh, mercy and kindness. Uh, so then the question is, well, how do I distinguish those attributes in God himself? So in James, uh, we can talk about, we can talk about uh, a bit of knowledge and a bit of kindness and a bit of strength, and I'm a bundle of all these bits kind of put together. Uh, but God's attributes are not in him as a kind of, um, you know, tightly, tightly bound bundle, so to speak. All that is in God is God, so his goodness is God, his wisdom is God, his justice is God. So then the question, uh, and this is to the point you're asking, Chris, then what are we to make of the attributes with regard to each other in God himself? And I think what we should say is, of all the attributes, that all the attributes in God are identical to each other, that his goodness is his wisdom, is his justice, is his power, 
but that there is a distinction with regard to the conception that we have of those attributes. So that when I think power, the conception in my mind is not the same as what comes into my mind when I think wisdom. And when I think wisdom, that's not conceptually identical uh, to justice. And so that we should argue that we're not simply um, speaking synonymously. When I say goodness and wisdom and love and justice, and I attribute those things to God, I'm not simply repeating myself because each one of those terms has a different conceptuality. And I can only think through those things, so to speak, bit by bit, so that the attributes are conceptually distinct in God. But when we say that they're not really distinct, what we mean is that there isn't an ontological unit of goodness next to an ontological unit of power, et cetera, for all the other attributes. And then what God is, is the bundle of units some ca- somehow kind of glued together. All of those things in God are just, Paul calls it theotes, godness. Um, but I should also hasten to add that while there's a conceptual distinction with a real identity, that doesn't, in saying that, I would hope it is not understood that I'm claiming to comprehend that, meaning I I can't comprehend an absolutely simple God. Um, I know why he must be simple, because he can't depend upon parts not identical with himself, and that's how composite things are. So I know why I must say he's simple, but I don't comprehend the simplicity that I attribute to him. I know how to guard that language, but that doesn't mean that I comprehend the referent of that language. There's still a sense in which what I'm really doing is I'm, in saying God is simple and that all the attributes in God are identical, is I'm I'm actually guarding against comprehending God. I'm ensuring that I don't comprehend him because I can, with enough time and leisure and expertise, comprehend a thing composed of parts, a bit of this and a bit of that, just so and just an orderly relationship. I can get my mind around that. But a being in which goodness is wisdom, is love, is justice, is power, is godness, without a real ontological distinction within that being, I know why I must say that, but I cannot imagine, I can believe, but I cannot imagine uh, what I've said with that kind of language. But to the question, doesn't this just make all the names for God synonymous? No, because the conceptual distinctions are still are still valid and they still guide and shape our God talk. And it's not just our God talk, it's actually how God himself speaks to us in Holy Scripture. When he lisps and babbles to us as to babes, as Calvin says in the Institutes, when he does that, he he speaks to us with the conceptual distinctions with which we're familiar and which are drawn from creation itself. And he gives us language drawn from the created order by which to begin to speak truly about him. What we need to be careful of, though, is thinking that the The modality or the manner of our God talk is, in a certain sense, a one-to-one map of the manner of his being. So a a kind of easy illustration of this is just to say, even the statement, God is simple, is not a simple statement. It's a multi-parted statement in which there's a subject and there's a predicate and then there's a verb uh, sort of linking them together. um, So that there's a sense in which the manner of my God thoughts and the manner of my God talk drawn from my creaturely situation and drawn even from the creatureliness of Scripture, um, contours the way that I think and speak about God. What I want to be careful of, though, is trying to map out some ontological structure of God in himself based upon my finite, multi-parted human way of thinking about him. Maybe that's a lot to take in uh, in one statement, but I think to your short answer, yes, we can talk about identity of attributes and distinction with regard to our conceptualities. Chris, if I can um, uh, piggyback on that, I think this is a very important thing uh, for people to understand, very important thing pastorally, um, that we recognize on the one hand God's godness, and he is altogether other than we are. Um, And in a sense, I think in Romans 1, 18 to 32, Paul is saying, we can read that off creation. Um, And if Paul could read it off creation, if David could read it off creation in the Psalms, how much more should we be able to read God's godness off creation? Because it looks as though we know and understand far more about the sheer vastness of creation than our forefathers did. And um, it's not, forgive the language. It's not rocket science uh, 
for us to conclude that the God who made all things visible and the things that are invisible to us and anything that is actually in its very nature invisible must be other than we are. Um, uh, some time ago, I, I was sitting in, in the garden and I had an ant land on my sleeve um, and I, I went into a kind of slightly melancholic soliloquy about this ant and thought, I mean, I am, I am majestically great by comparison with this ant, but the contrast between this ant and myself is minuscule by comparison between myself and the being of God. So that on the one hand, God's incomprehensibility, but then on the other hand, God's self-revelation, um, that he has is, he is actually created us as his image and likeness, and therefore he has created us in such a way that we are able to apprehend him, although we can't comprehend him. And not only has he made us that way as, as, ref, as reflecting himself in such a way that there may be mutual communication between us, but as James was saying, he's actually provided us with the categories of that uh, communication from his side and from our side, so that he legitimates the language that we use that for example, distinguishes his power from his wisdom um, or his righteousness from his love. Because unlike him, we, we are not, as it were, if I put it this way, intellectually dense in the best sense, dense enough to be able to comprehend the character of the God that we apprehend. I think sometimes the the latent and sometimes expressed fear that people have of the classical doctrine of God is that, it, it, as James said earlier on, it creates a God who is remote from us. But the classical doctrine of God, emphasizing his simplicity, emphasizing uh, these attributes, has always been held hand in hand with this principle that we all know from Calvin that God has always accommodated himself to us. And even the creation of man as his image um, was a, an accommodation of himself to us so that we might know him, trust him, apprehend him, love him, live for his glory, enjoy him, ultimately be, be with him forever. So I think when we take the whole Bible representation of the classical doctrine of God, there's, there's no reason for people to fear either that this is a God who is far away but not near. This is a God who, who dwells in the high and holy place, yes, but he's also the God who comes and dwells with those who are of a humble and contrite heart. And when we therefore grasp the whole biblical emphasis. We have on the one hand the unchanging God who is our refuge in a very changing world, and we're able to hold together in this beautiful existential balance the, the adoration of this God and at the same time the consciousness of the deep friendship of this God. And that's been the story of the church throughout the generations, I think. Chris, there's a great illustration often used by the ancients, medievals. You'll find it again in the in the in the Puritan literature, of of an analogy of light passing through a prism or through colored glass, and that when we approach God, we're approaching God in the order of a of a ref, of refracted beams of light. And so, if you think of pure white light as something that the that the naked eye does not perceive, and as that pure white light passes through a prism and we could even say in the analogy that that prism is, is creation and revelation, uh, that as it passes through the prism of creation and revelation, the light that we perceive is not in its pure white uh, simplicity, but we perceive it in, a, in refracted beams of glory. And I, I think in one respect, the attributes of God are like this. The, 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 the goodness and the wisdom and the power and the love and justice as they are in God are, are just himself. 
I think as we think about this analogy of light passing through a prism and approaching God in that refracted spectral glory, there's something about this that even corresponds to the way that Scripture speaks about And when Job says in Job 26, when we perceive the power of God in the mighty thunder and in the great and awesome deeds uh, that we perceive in nature, that these are but the fringes of his ways. And then Job even says, how faint a word we hear of him. Uh, and you think about this, that all the, all the revelation of God in nature and even the revelation of God in Scripture, while full and abundantly full of truth, are but the fringes of his ways. They are but the faint word that we hear. There's a sense in which the, the glory of God exceeds our most exalted thoughts of him. That doesn't make our thoughts true or untrue, I should say. It just makes our thoughts creaturely. It means that while I have a thought of the infinite, I don't have an infinite thought of the infinite. While I have a thought of the God who is simple, I don't have a simple thought of the God who is simple, that there's always this transcendence of God, and yet even that is not to push God out of the frame, so to speak, or render him aloof, but it's simply to say that God draws near to us by accommodating the manifestation of himself, whether those are through his mighty acts or even through the words that he gives us in Holy Scripture, that all of these are like that light in Solomon's temple. While the heaven of heavens cannot contain God, there is a sense in which God is pleased to dwell among his people in a light that he calls Shekinah and that he places in their midst. He has given us words and he has given us revelation and he has placed the knowledge of himself and even, even the felt presence of God in our midst through these created and accommodated means. And it's it's these means by which we approach God, but we, we don't want to assume that these created means are in a certain sense a, a, a one-to-one measurement of the divine being himself. All of this is God lisping and babbling to babes. Would you say God has emotions? Why or why not? I would not, <laughs> but that's a good question. Uh, but I think we need to qualify that. Uh, we would want to qualify that heavily. Um, our our Reformed confessions and even the medieval and patristic literature would all say that God is without passions. And so if by emotions uh, is meant sort of the equivalent of passions, uh, then I would want to not say that God has emotions in that respect. And, and what I mean in particular is by passion, a, a passion is a state of being, usually a state of mind or soul that is entered into by a process of undergoing. And in fact, that's what passion means. Passion means to, to submit or to suffer or to undergo. Now, it doesn't always mean that we're undergoing an experience of pain. You can undergo passions of pleasure as well to to fall in love is to move from a state of not loving to seeing something or someone lovely and then having your heart moved to desire the goodness of that individual. But the reason that's a passion is not because of its intensity. And I think sometimes we, we make this mistake. We think passion means intensity or passion means caring about. Uh, I think what we want to say is that God cares intensely but that he doesn't care via an experience of passion because passion is not so much about the intensity or about the caring. Passion is about the manner of it. Um, and so what we would want, what I would want to say is that God's care for the world is not a state of, of being in God that is in a certain sense um, enacted by the world's operation upon him, that God isn't waiting for the world, so to speak, to stir him up, that God isn't made to care. So when I say that God is without passions, I don't mean that he doesn't care. I mean that the care that God has for the world, whether you're talking about his love for his elect or even his general provision for the just and the unjust, that care that he has for the world is not something that he's moved to by the world, but rather out of pure generosity, it's something that he lavishes on the world. The same thing I should we should say, though, even about his holy opposition to sin, that it's God's nature as holy and as one who loves his own holiness to by nature be infinitely opposed to all that is opposed to his holiness. So that God's hatred for sin and his utter holy detestation of that which is ungodly is not so much an emotional state that God enters into after previously not hating sin, 
but that rather it's God's nature to be opposed to sin really as the as the the, the flip side of the coin if God loves his own holiness then an aspect of his love of his own holiness is in fact a, a hatred of all that is opposed to his holiness so that when we talk about God's love or God's hate we don't want to think of these as passions as states of being that God sort of enters into via a process of experience, but rather that it's his nature to love and that it's his nature to be opposed to all that is opposed to his holiness and goodness. So in that respect, we can say God cares intensely about his own creation and about the righteousness or wickedness of his own creatures, but that this is not a care that in a certain sense, God was waiting for the world to make him care. And so in that respect, um, historically, we've said God is without passions, but by no means have we meant that he doesn't care about the world. I don't know if that gets at the, the question, Chris, as you, were, as you were conceiving it, but if by emotions we mean, does God care, then certainly we should say God cares perfectly. Um, is God made to care? Then we should say that God isn't made to anything, but rather he's the maker of all um, and maybe draw the distinction uh, that way. Chris, maybe I can um, just uh, develop this a little by uh, saying um, I think sometimes we we get into difficulties here because we are thinking in a, a man-like way um, things that are important to us. And if these things are not true of God, then that further makes us feel that God is distant from us. And there are several things that I think we need to come back to saying. One is that Scripture has given us language that we can use. Um, and it's always appropriate for us to go back to the point that God has given us this language. He's revealed himself in this way. And it's appropriate that we think of him in this way. It's interesting in that respect that uh, off the top of my head, I don't think the word emotion appears anywhere in the Bible, it's a, it's, a, it's a rather modern construct. So level number one is the legitimacy of us thinking about God in the categories that he's given to us in Scripture. There's a, there's a, there's a question that goes beyond that, which is really, so how do we put all these things together in a consistent, systematic systematic logical way? How do we put together um, expressions of, for example, God repenting or changing his mind with the fact that we know that God is immutable? And it's as we work at that level to try to see what the whole Bible is saying about something, that we're, we're wanting to hold two things together. One is the immutability of God, but the other is the life of God. So when we speak about the immutability of God or the impassibility of God, we're, we're not thinking of God as another photograph on our, on our smartphone, uh, as though God were like stuck in a moment um, with no expression on his face. Uh, what we're actually thinking about is a God who is full of life. Um, the God who is, as it were, the original of everything that is good and that we value in our own creation as human beings. But we never confuse the original with the, the small-scale copy. And we realize that what we may experience as emotions if we can, as it were, see them in their holiest form, they have their origin in God himself. But God is not man. I mean, I think again and again in our theology, um, even in, in, in some good theologians, we keep falling to the temptation that we can be as God um, and one of the things James has been emphasizing here a number of times now is just to remember that we are not God. I remember my Latin teacher at school telling us that when a Roman general had a triumph, they stuck a slave in the chariot with him 
who said two words over and over and over and over again, and I think they're great words for us as theologians. Homo is, remember you're a man, and you're only a man. You'll never be anything but a man. When you die and are raised and live with God in eternity, you'll still be a creature. You'll still be a, a human being. Do not give way to the temptation to think that you will ever be as God. You will never be happy if you fall to that temptation. Now, when it comes to the actual language, then I think theologians have differed in their use of language, sometimes without defining what they mean by that use of language. So, for example, uh, B.B. Warfield, whom we all appreciate, uh, says at one point that a God without em an emotional life would be no God at all. Um, that could easily be misread, and I doubt very much if uh, what Warfield is saying is that God has an emotional life like ourselves. I think what he's saying is that in, and this is a very important element to introduce into the conversation, uh, even if we've not time to develop it, the God we are speaking about is the personal triune God, who in the unity of his being in all of these characteristics that we call his attributes, is eternally expressing and enjoying these attributes in his own being. So that in the density of God's being, there is a life experienced, an original life, an independent life, a life of aseity, a life of interpersonalness in the mystery of the Trinity that makes our experience of life um, minuscule, not only uh, in its range by comparison, but in its intensity by comparison. So again, um, I've said this before, when we come back to reflecting on the, the classical theologians expounding the classical doctrine of God, when, when you see them handling this in a range of different areas, uh, pastorally, in homilies, and in preaching, and in catechetical teaching, in theological writings, um, they keep coming back to this principle that we are talking here about the three-person God who has life, all life, in himself and all attributes in himself in their original form. And again, I keep, I just, I myself, I keep coming back to Genesis 1, which heads towards 126 to uh, the end of the chapter and ourselves being made as miniatures to reflect him, uh, to enjoy in our own sphere what God enjoys in his sphere so that we may have knowledge of him, communion with him, so that he can communicate to us and we can communicate to him, as it were, in terms, and one might even say experience, that he has in infinite form, we have in miniature form, and that enables us not to absolutely comprehend him, get our arms round him and say, now I've got you, but to apprehend him, to know him, to trust him, to love him, and to adore him. So I think we're back to this mantra um, that the classical doctrine of God is actually the doctrine of God that provides most pastoral help for, uh, for the Church of Jesus Christ in every generation. I just wanted to just footnote on that, that the emphasis on fullness of life is important so that, again, not frozen in a moment, that there's not a kind of lifelessness, a, a stoic stillness in God, but it's it's really the boundless fullness of life so that impassibility is actually a consequent of fullness of life, not of imperfection. Some, I think uh, one theologian said that such a God would be a metaphysical iceberg, uh, I think that was the late Clark Pinnock. But in fact, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, it's because God is so perfectly boundless and abundant in his life, in his goodness, in his being, 
and and even in his care for the creature that he doesn't require an experience of passion or emotion to kind of stir him up. I I need to have emotions in order to be stirred up to care about what I need to care about. I need provocation. I need prodding. Um, you could ask my wife. I need some I need some stimulation in order to care about what I need to care about. And so for that reason, I undergo passions because those passions stimulate me to care. But because God cares with the perfect fullness of his being, he doesn't require an experiential stimulus to care more. And so when we say that God is passionless, far from saying that he doesn't care, we're really saying he's passionless because he doesn't need to be provoked to care more than he does. Um, I think that's an important point with this fullness of being aspect as opposed to stoic stillness. Um, I think that's a caricature of the classical view. How should we respond to those who say that classical theism isn't biblical or even that it's some sort of synthesis between Greek philosophy and the Bible? How, how would you all respond? The accusation um, of the use of, for example, Hellenistic philosophical categories and, and so on, um, I am a little suspicious of the the logic that is employed when when that statement is focused on the classical doctrine of God in terms of these particular divine attributes of of immutability and impassibility. And I say that because when you think about the ways in which um, all of us uh, speak theologically, um, we follow through that logic, and we, we have basically lost our basic theological vocabulary. And so, you know, part of my response is to say, sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Do not use that logic with respect to one aspect of classical theology without recognizing that if you're going to do that in that aspect, you have consistently to do it in all other aspects. I think the second thing to say is um, that I believe there is a stronger argument for the classical doctrine of God in this area as being grounded very clearly in the statements of Scripture than some of the other classical language that is used that is almost universally accepted. So when we talk about the immutability of God, when we talk about God as eternal, when, when we talk about the impassibility of God, then it's possible to direct people fairly simply back to passages in Scripture and say, um, yes, there are these elements taught in Scripture, but you will see that they are grounded in these elements. Um, the unchanging nature of God, the reason you are not consumed is because I, the Lord, do not change. Does that mean God doesn't change? It looks as though that's what it means. It says, I, the Lord, do not change. And whether you read that in Hebrew or in Arabic or Chinese or French or Gallic, it seems to mean I do not change. Um, and the same with these other aspects. So I think some of the animus that has been directed against the classical doctrine of God here has actually not taken account of a, a solid biblical uh, theological interpretation of the divine attributes. Um, and I think that biblical exposition is really where we should begin in these matters. We are talking, James and I, theologically, um, because you've introduced the theme theologically for us. But at the end of the day, I think if you, if you, if you press our noses, we will say, well, let's go back to see that this is actually grounded in the teaching of Scripture. I think a doctrine like divine simplicity, while you don't have a the text for divine immutability, James 1.17, Malachi 3.6, are, are more sort of there and apparent on the surface of the text, it's also not difficult to arrive at a doctrine like divine simplicity uh, via a contemplation of God as, as, as absolute creator of all things. And so if you take a text like Romans 11.36, from him, through him, and to him are all things— 
Um, I would say then if that is the case, then God cannot be composed of parts because a thing composed of parts is from or through its parts, which are distinct from itself. But if all things are from God, through God, and to God, then God himself could not be composed of parts, or that statement just, just simply couldn't be true. In other words, yes, that's a classical doctrine of divine simplicity, and I can work that out with some technical grammar, but, but before I ever get there, the inner core logic of divine simplicity, that God does not depend on what is not God in order to be God, and yet everything else depends upon God, um, that, that automatically requires that I maintain a theology that doesn't let go of that truth. Well, divine simplicity is just a mechanism des really designed to guard the core truth of that statement. The same thing is true with regard to all statements in Scripture treating God as the absolute first cause of all things. If Scripture is unambiguous in attributing primal causality to God as the one who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and dry land, and all that is therein, the one who's not served by human hands as though he needed anything, but rather gives to all— that, that is so widely attested throughout all of scriptures and all the various genre of scripture that the implications of absolute primal causality, and I would argue immutability, impassibility, simplicity, aseity, these are all doctrines really designed to, to guard and to enshrine that absolute primacy of the divine being, which is expli explicitly witnessed in Holy Scripture. Before we engage in the conceptual apparatus furnished by Greek philosophy, before we ever do that, and I, I su submit that that can be done responsibly, but even before we do that, um, the reason for holding these truths is already grounded in Scripture's own witness to God as the one from whom and through whom and to whom are all things. And then the rest is just, what we're doing then is we are just we are just borrowing a conceptual apparatus from the Greeks, language, so to speak. I mean, a pastor does this when he preaches a sermon. He borrows the language and the idiom of his people, of his time, of modern science or, uh, or other sort of modern arts, and he deploys them as tools to amplify the teaching of Scripture. And the Christian theologian can certainly do this. And it's, it's not just even the conceptual apparatus. There's also a sense in which even in their darkness and in their unbelief, we should say that some of these pagans saw more truth than other pagans. Uh, so, for instance, when, when Aristotle says that God is an unmoved mover— uh, I would argue that he's not wrong. He's not as right as he could be. Um, there are certainly so many things that make that an inadequate or less than fully adequate description of God as creator and redeemer, but there's a certain truth in it. That truth needs to be held on to. It probably needs to be amplified, and it certainly needs to be situated uh, with a biblical conception of God, but we don't want to simply say, well, you're a pagan. Uh, I think of the words of Augustine of Hippo, that wherever the Christian may find truth, it is his Lord's. Um, there's a very real sense in which whoever has the truth, um, we, we shouldn't despise them because of their pedigree, not because we esteem them as men, but because we esteem the truth. Um, and in this respect, I think that if even, even in the pagan tradition, if there's a truth to be had, the Christian can certainly appropriate it because truth does not conflict with truth, and the God of nature and the God of Scripture is the same, and he is not opposed to himself. And I, I think if we—I I, I know that there's a lot of modern concern with that, but there's a very real sense in which if you're going to make what's called the, the Hellenistic argument and say, well, that's from the Greeks, we don't accept Greek pagan contributions, then I think we have to recognize that even among the Greeks, there is a vast difference. Uh, Greek, maybe Greek philosophers— might have denied that the first cause of all things is passable, but certainly Greek religion, if you read, if you've read the Homeric epics or, or any of the literature of that period, Greek religion certainly believes in passable deities. And so the question, so simply to say, well, you hold to an impassable God, that's from Greek philosophy, um, then we should ask the question, then why isn't a passable God just simply a maintaining of something from Greek religion. And I think it's important to understand that the Greeks themselves um, do almost galactic battle with each other over questions like whether God is beyond be God is beyond all being or whether he's just one of the beings up on Mount Olympus. The Greek religionists and the Greek philosophers were in fact 
deeply entrenched against each other with their understandings of deity. Um, so the uh, so sort of the accusation, well, that's from Greek pagan heritage. I, I would want to ask the question, Greek philosophers, Greek religionists, uh, because even they do battle with each other. The interest, the, our interest is not the pedigree of the idea. Our interest is whether it is true and whether it can be squared with scripture. By the grace and gift of God, can I put that into the service of a biblical and true theology? So to sum up uh, and trying to bring this uh, conversation that it feels like we're, we're just getting started in truly, uh, and perhaps we have an eternity to continue this conversation, uh, how would you advise Christians to better uh, and more rightly speak of who God is. Maybe I can begin again, Chris. Um, in general, what we want to do is to take our Christian friends to Scripture um, and to explore the riches of Scripture. Now, I think perhaps to some Christians, the conversation we've just had could seem a little recondite. We've just been talking about Greek philosophy. Um, you know, most Christians may not be too familiar with too many Greek philosophers or their philosophy. Um, but we first of all take all to Scripture. But then we also recognize that when we are trying to take the whole of Scripture, and to speak the whole of Scripture into the contemporary world, we're actually all always taking categories, language categories, that we don't find in their original form in Scripture in order to do that. So to go back to the previous question about the influence of Greek philosophy, um, it's easy to criticize the employment of Greek philosophical categories um, like substance uh, in the doctrine of God, in the doctrine of the Trinity, and to completely forget that every time we communicate the gospel, we're, we're using secular philosophical categories. And I, it would be an interesting PhD study for somebody to use to see the transitions through the centuries from the way preachers and Christians in general have used what are actually the philosophical categories of their own era in order to communicate the gospel to that era. So that is always a second level study in which we're sitting back and answering the question, how do we put the whole of Scripture together? So that from the point of view, for example, of a pastor in the church, in my experience, it's, it's relatively unusual for a pastor actually to have as a focus in a series of expositions the doctrine of God, the character of God, uh, who God is. I remember many years ago, I think I may have been a teenager when I came across A.W. Tozer's book um, on God. And when I came to the United States to teach in seminary, there was a man who worked for the seminary um, who had been in the same denomination. And I said to him, um, are there any recordings of A.W. Tozer, who I knew was not wholly sympathetic to certain aspects of Calvinism, but had been a serious preacher. He went into the trunk of his car and he gave me a dozen tapes of sermons of Tozer and I listened to them on a long journey. And I thought, I wonder if in the 1950s, I wonder how many other preachers within the vastness of American evangelicalism were seeking to communicate the greatness of God to their congregations the way A.W. Tozer was. And I rather suspected from what I knew then and what I've seen since that it was pretty infrequent. Um, and so it shouldn't surprise us, I think, that we sometimes feel our evangelicalism is shallow, nor should it surprise us that our worship is light. Um, that as David Wells uh, used to say, you know, in a sense, God has lost all of his weight. He's no longer the weighty 
God of Scripture. Um, and so I think, if anything, this discussion is for us, those of us who may be preachers, um, a real stimulus to ask ourselves, how can we expound this in Scripture? How can we go back to the Psalms or uh, narratives in the Old Testament or specific passages in the New Testament to expound the godness of God to our congregation? And then how can we help them to understand the inner consistency of all these different elements that enable them to communicate the whole Bible message to our contemporary world by uh, using, yes, the categories of the present time, but also the categories that the church has found serviceable all through the centuries. And not only that, but um, all of our categories are ultimately inadequate, but the church has never found more adequate categories than the categories that were hammered out and forged in the first few centuries of the Christian church. So to me, um, to me personally, the stimulus of this is to better expound what Scripture says about God so that we may become in our own uh, day and generation, uh, as, for example, the text in Daniel, are people who know their God and therefore do exploits, because that's the crying need of our day. That's really the motif of R.C.'s book. Everyone's a theologian. Um, and when everyone is a theologian in that sense of coming to the knowledge of God, then our worship will be so transformed that, as one of the early fathers said, it will be our worship that destroys the temple of the pagan. And we are crying out in our own day when the world is full of pagan temples of all kinds for the worship of God's people to be so transcendent in its character that the Dagons of this world are destroyed by comparison with the transcendence and glory. And yes, the human emotion that's involved in the worship of what the New Testament calls the one who is our great God and Savior. Dr. Dolezal, closing thoughts? Well, I would like to echo uh, Dr. Ferguson's uh, emphasis, first of all, on no scripture. If you want to speak about God rightly, know scripture well uh, and be full of it uh, in, your, in your mind. Uh, memorize it, spend time with it, uh, grow to know the God of holy scripture. If you want to focus on something in particular, I would say focus particularly on how Scripture distinguishes God from creatures. What is it? What is the criteria that Scripture furnishes to, to mark out God in distinction from all so-called gods, from all imposters? Uh, I think of Paul writing in Galatians 4 when he talks to the Galatians, and he says that they once were enslaved to those things which by nature are no gods. So if you thought that you were going to be able to escape the whole uh, obligation to understand divine nature, um, it turns out that we need to focus on the divine nature so far as it has been revealed to us so that we don't confuse that nature with the nature of imposters and of idols. To, to guard our hearts from idols requires that we have a knowledge of the truth. If we're going to discern fool's gold, then we're going to have to know what gold is. And if we're going to be able to detect idols, then we're going to have to have a, a standard of godness, e even imperfect and finite and accommodated as it is, but true, a true standard of godness by which to measure the truth claims uh, of these things and to make sure that our hearts are fixed on the one true God. Maybe as a final point on that, I would say the same. Become don't despise uh, the grammar of our Christian tradition of, of the fathers and the medievals and the, the, the reformers and those who followed them. Um, there is really a, a, a grand grammar of Christian theology that has given us not perfect words, but good words and words that are useful in guarding our hearts and our minds and useful in bringing us more deeply into the truth about God. 
to to spend time with those resources uh, and to think and and meditate on them deeply and to even begin to make that that language and that that conceptual structure uh, your own uh, can can really do nothing but both enrich your talk and your thoughts about God and also begin to put guardrails on it so that we don't talk about God as though he is just a, a great version of a, of a man, perhaps without a body, um, that we in fact worship God as he truly is, recognizing wherein he is transcendent, even if we understand that we don't comprehend transcendence. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for helping us with this conversation today. It is our mission and desire at Ligonier Ministries to help Christians to think about the God who is and to propagate the knowledge of the God who is to as many people as possible. And if you're just joining this discussion, and perhaps this is the first time you've uh, dipped your toe into these waters, go to our website and find uh, additional resources to help you to study the scriptures and to study the history of the theology that has been given to us so that we would be able to live more faithfully even today in our generation. May God continue to equip you as you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ.